So the teams began with the standard PDTS cover sheet from National, and they were trying to cover all areas of prepare diagnose. They began with an agenda, and the vice president pitched the agenda, as well as a definition of the prepare phase. They touch base on the goals and success criteria that's covered in their charters, a bar graph of historical performance of length of stay. They went into change management from the team perspective on how they're going to communicate and other change management plans uh, that are coming. They provided us with a team picture, which was nice. They talked about their collaborative efforts, especially with the collaborative care team and how that impacts their length of stay efforts. They touched on key discoveries or the key learnings to the midpoint, which hits the nail on the head with the national standard. And they talked about the anticipated barriers that, they, that are, uh, they foresee coming up. So here's the video and I hope it's helpful and uh, thank you very much. One group. There's another group over here, Cynthia, would you raise your hand? Over on that side. There's another group up here by Kurt. And I'll see Kurt. And uh, there'll be a group behind the screen here. It doesn't matter where you start, you'll have a chance to get to all of them. We'll take 15 minutes per team, and this will be the format that they'll walk you through. So they'll walk you through um, their problem statement. They will walk you through why they selected that problem. So as Rosie alluded to, there was a value stream and there were lots of splats or opportunities for improvement, ways in which we were uh, not meeting our length of stay or readmissions or whatever. And they'll walk you through how they selected that problem. And they'll also talk to you about what they've learned by collecting data and there's been a lot that they have learned. And then um, by solving this problem, they hope to sort of they'll give you a little glimpse as to what they think problem will solve. Um, then they'll walk you through their A3. This is a visual A3 that everybody's been trained on, um, which is an organized way to walk through and solve problems. Uh, so they'll do that for you. I will give you a warning at about um, 10 minutes that will tell you that you have five minutes left. And then we'll rotate clockwise. So wherever you start, just rotate clockwise. So we've got four teams, so I want you to get into four relatively, if you take a look and you see two people at one and 10 at another, you might want to help level that. Um, so we have about the same amount. Uh, before you do that, I want to talk to you a little bit about your role as a guest here today. What we would really love for you to do is to help improve the team's thinking. Um, they've done a lot of thinking already, um, but by asking them good questions, um, things like, um, what's the problem that you're attempting to solve? How will you measure success? Uh, get them thinking about that. What we would love for you to avoid are things that we call a Trojan question, which is, have you considered, insert my amazing idea here. Um, <laughs> that's great. Thank you for that, for sharing ideas. At this point, um, what we would really appreciate is just more thinking about the solutions that they're coming up with. Um, ask them what obstacles they think they'll meet. So they, they've got answers. Um, and then please, again, move to the next team when time is called so that we can rotate in a uh, manner. Before we do that, any questions? We're going to move some of these chairs. So four locations. Um, teams, why don't you go ahead and get where your location is, and then we'll redistribute our guests. Um, but this is a specific side, side talk for the um, discharge process. So we first identified our process, which is the discharge, and then identified that our supplier is the treatment team. So um, their output will be handed off to us, and that's where we begin. Our inputs are uh, what we call our must-haves for us to um, start our process and move through our process. And some of those inputs are the discharge order, the medical equipment, all the referrals, all the things that we need for um, the patient to be discharged appropriately. And then our outputs are um, the things that our customers expect from this process. Um, 
So some of those are coordinated, cost-effective quality care, um, a clear discharge plan, all the resources being coordinated. Those are the things that our customers expect from us. And our customers are our patient, our family, our attorney, our payers, and our providers. So that's where we started. And then we moved on to the next um, tool that we use, which is a value stream map. This is the value stream map for the discharge team. And you will see um, other maps for the other two teams also. But our um, map starts from the time that the discharge order is written <coughs> until um, the patient is discharged from EPIC. And like what Michelle said, we are changing this so that um, we, can, we it will end from uh, it will end at the time that the bed is ready for the new um, patient. So um, the steps in between are the steps that we need to get from point one to point ten or twenty. <laughs> <laughs> but as you can see, there's a lot of steps, and the reason why, and we have identified that there's a lot of um, steps that we really don't need to have if we actually do the discharge planning appropriately. These steps don't have to be here. But as this is current state when we created this, so this shows a lot of extra steps in here. The little splats in here that you see are the issues and barriers that we have identi identified throughout the process. A um, couple of major waiting splats, issues, barriers that we um, identified are the delay from waiting for the ride from family or ambulance, or you know, it's ambulance or um, rides and then the delay from transporters, and then delay for, from filling the medications, and delay from our in starting the discharge process due to various um, factors like workload and priorities. Um, the entire map took approximately around five to 17 hours, and that's including all the NAND value added times and all the waiting and delays, but the actual value added time is only one to three hours, so the rest are all waste and so with that, we identified 30 spots, which I'm going to hand off to Catherine because she will talk about them in more detail. I will. Yes. Thanks, Sarah. Okay. So um, we took our splats, which I love, and we listed them, and we have 30. And uh, but we don't have the most. The treatment team has the most. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't think. Is there a prize for the most splats? <laughs> anyway. Okay. So um, and then we put it on this chart, which I admit is unlabeled and needs to be labeled badly. But I will tell you what it stands for. And so what? So this is frequency. How often does something happen? From a lot to a little. And um, severity. The, no. What? Severity. Severity, yeah, that's right. Severity from little to a lot. So we, we looked at all of our splats and put them on the chart, and we decided that these in green are the ones that are the most severe and happen the most often. So those are the ones we want to pay attention to. So we highlighted them in green, and we highlighted them on here, as you can see. So we had 10, I think, that we did. Yep. Okay, and so then um, the priority issues, the top priority issues, are um, that uh, the delay in discharge happened because the nurse is busy. You know, the nurse is definitely busy. Okay, and waiting for a ride was a big delay in discharge. Um, minimum one hour for medication to be filled. So that's waiting for the medications that they're going to take home with them. That's another problem. Um, patient is not aware or their family is not aware that they're being discharged today. That was a problem. Um, delay in receiving belongings, etc. You can read the rest of them. Just a high volume of discharges at certain times based a lot on um, the physicians, their timing, um, you know, as they go through their day. Um, and just, uh, we just aren't prioritizing um, transport and discharge. Okay, and then of course we also had an epic issue too. All right, so those are our top ones that we focused on and we narrowed it. We started with the top two which are, um, which I will hand off to, I'll just hand off to Heather. The same thing. <laughs> Take it away, Heather. So, uh, hoping for the biggest impact, we of course took the top two. Um, the first one that we addressed is the delay of up to six hours for patients waiting to arrive. Um, and we focused mostly on patients going home, so that ride would be their family. So our goal, we would like to get them 
out the door within 15 to 30 minutes of getting their discharge paperwork. And currently we have a gap of five plus hours there. Uh, so trying to determine a root cause, we, we brainstormed and came up with these ideas and then put them in order here. So I'm just going to go over the prior um, order of importance. So, Primarily, we discovered that the team is not aware of the discharge plan as well as the patient and the family. So it's a communication issue there. Um, family is not available because, of course, they don't know if the patient is going to leave, and we don't ex explain to them our expectations of what will happen on discharge day. And then providers not being available due to rounding to write their discharge orders on a timely matter for us. So we have actually started working on this one. Um, in the current process, and Jacqueline's going to go over that with you in a moment. Um, our second problem statement, we took the uh, delayed DC by RN, and we're going to address that one too. Um, so target, about one to three hours. We're currently one to three hours off of that as well. And we prioritized our root causes here also. It discovered that there's a workload issue. Um, also, as well as it could be related to time management and delegation, and then not seeing discharge as a priority when we're caring for our patients. And we're currently in the process of developing an action plan to address that one. So I'm going to give it over to Jacqueline, and she'll tell you what we've been working on here. Yeah. So hi, I'm Jacqueline. And so what we what we did at this step then after our uh, root cause analysis is we remapped our process flow in our new version. So this is our future state. And taking out all of those, what we were referring to as splats or non-value added issues that, that we identified, we have a much more streamlined process. So once that discharge order is written, then the team already knows ahead of time whether the discharge destination is going to be home or to a skilled nursing facility or an adult family home or other location such as that. And there's a defined order and just a very few steps, as you can see, that have to occur in order for that patient to be discharged fully from the hospital and out. So um, going home, then we have our Hugs fax the prescriptions right away to uh, the pharmacy. And then in the process of while that's occurred, the CNA can take care of taking vitals and getting the patient dressed. Um, and then the RN can, is clear to come in and remove any lines um, or dressings, anything like that. And then once the meds arrive, the RN can go in and give the medications and review the ABS with the patient. And at that point, the RN can put in a transport request and the patient's ready to go. Um, so as the transporter is bringing the patient down to the vehicle, they can stop by the cashier's office if the patient has any belongings in the safe downstairs and they'll be able to pick that up on the way out rather than making redundant trips back and forth from the cashier's office to the floor and then getting the patient and bringing them down. Um, and then if the patient's ride is not available, which is a real issue that we identified, we are in the process of considering and, and looking into the feasibility of a discharge waiting area where we have patients that are medically stable, that are fully discharged from the hospital, and they have somewhere safe to stay inside our walls while they wait for their ride. And real close to admit, main admitting and close to the valet service so they can get assistance going back into the car. Um, and then the same process is, mu again, much more streamlined if it's a skilled nursing facility discharge. Uh, the nurse is going to give um, transfer information to the accepting RN at the facility. Uh, the HUC can pull together the MAR um, medication orders, things like that. We don't have to worry about outpatient pharmacy meds because the patient's going straight to a facility. Um, we get their belongings from a safe if they do have belongings. And then the RN can call for a report and then this ambulance should already be scheduled knowing that the patient's destination location ahead of time. So that, that should be a smooth process. One of the things that we identified in order to help with this discharge timing is we found that um, staff as well as patients and families have no expectation of what time they would leave the hospital. Um, and as we found, 66% uh, of them didn't even know what day they were leaving the hospital until that day. So. One of the ideas that we're uh, looking at creating is a standardized way of communicating to staff as well as families and patients that we have a, a plan for them in terms of their discharge day and time frame of that discharge so that they can set up their right ahead of time and have make preparations. So one of the ways that we um, looked at 
taking this workflow and creating a standardized work process is looking at just those, again, this is for a discharge home. It's a very short list of things that have to occur because all those other areas that took so much time prior are now being handled by the treatment team, which is the phase of the hospital state that they should be handled in. And so we have a very finite timeline here of how far past the order written we expect these things to be done. And we've got nurses on the team, and this is a very reasonable ask. Of course, working with other nursing duties and prioritization and all of those aspects. And again, um, separate for a, a skilled nursing or other facility discharge, same thing, even fewer steps. But everything's well delineated for the RN so that he or she can appropriately triage their day knowing that they've got a discharge. And then I'm going to hand it over to Tracy so she can talk about our next steps. Thank you, Jacqueline. So our next steps um, will be finalizing uh, work for discharge process to home and other facilities. Um, we're going to continue on uh, pursuing a feasible discharge area that is safe for our patients, making sure we have good inclusion criteria for that discharge waiting area. Um, the discharge time, we are going to be working with the teams to finalize the plan for that. And um, like Jackie said, there's, we're working on some signage for um, letting family knows, know when the discharge time is. And we are going to work on addressing um, uh, when the rooms are ready. And um, they're saying they're ready when they're not. So we're going to be working on that with the admission. And I hope that last one makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you guys have questions? Yeah. Um, when we talked about pharmacy, I just was questioning, and that is filling all of their discharge prescriptions, every one of them, or is it just new prescriptions? What gets filled when someone has their discharge <coughs> prescriptions? And then another question when it came to when they're discharged, you're going to a holding area. Who would be dispensing the medications? Or would the patients be responsible for knowing what to take whenever they need it if they're there for a number of hours? So the first question was, are we going to fill the prescriptions? Are prescriptions for discharge or just new ones? I wasn't sure that wasn't clear. Well, that, that is something that we have to talk about. When we were um, creating the workflow, we said, some patients don't want to fill the prescriptions here, but I know we have to encourage them to fill it here. But that was a delay. Um, we identified that the delay from filling the medications comes from filling it here. So that is an issue that we will um, address in the future for sure. It's one of our top priority. Um, but for, for that streamlined process, we were hoping if the medications are filled here, that um, as soon as the order is written, the day before, hopefully the day before um, the plan has been written, then the um, nurses can work on um, getting what they need to get that filled and then um, get that fax as soon as we can. And we're still anticipating there will be a delay. And so we're hoping that once we address that issue that it won't be an hour minimum hour. Break. But we also know that others would like to fill it out. So for those that would like to fill it outside, we just give them the prescription. Um, and then we fax them as a courtesy to which only takes few minutes, so it's not going to cost the way. And then the second question? When there is a discharge holding area mm -hmm. at the end, mm -hmm. I'm going to be here for three hours, but my Coumadin's due. How do I get my medicine? If I had it faxed and I didn't keep that prescription, how are patients going to get, and I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah, yeah. no, that's a How are they going to get their medications, and are they astute enough to Go get water or have a bottle of water there and chug it or right. how are you doing that? So, so um, there is, and we mentioned it somewhere in here, there's going to be a discharge area criteria that has to be met. And so if a patient needs to take a time to medication and is not cognitively able to independently manage that safely, then that would exclude them from being able to be in that waiting area. So um, the, we, we have a discharge unit criteria um, as a draft model right now. We're waiting to hear back on um, legal and risk management 
issues about having that area and the area that we've identified as the proposed area. And then once that occurs, then we'll take it to that next step and look at that discharge criteria and get input from all the teams on that to make sure that yes, we're, we're, we're only putting patients down there that are safe and independent and able to manage things like that. Did you um, have to, would patients kind of just go in there and be on their own or would somebody be staffing? Yeah, no, our expectation is that these patients are medically clear and able to take care of themselves. So um, we don't anticipate and we don't plan on having any kind of staff member. I think, um, I, I don't know what Russ is going to say, but I, I think they're going to tell you that while the people are, or the patients are in the confines of these walls, you're, you're responsible and, um, and I don't remember who did this, somebody in our system <laughs> exactly. So, so just something to consider, and a good question to ask is, does it have to be staffed to the regulatory risk folks? And then, if it does, um, my question would be, what other um, modalities, or when you look at the cost of that one person to sit down there, and maybe compare it to other ways to get people out of the hospital, if you go down that path? We are not currently considering going down that path until we know the final answer from risk management. We know of other hospital systems in our region that do have such a unit, um, and obviously it has passed their legal and compliance areas, so that is being looked into by our risk management team here at St. Joe's, and when we get that information back from her, then we'll move forward in terms of looking at other, other alternatives versus uh, staffing. Staffing the unit is not our intention. Um, and it's truly not part of our plan. Um, one other area that I'm not sure, it's somewhere up here and I'm not sure that anybody touched on it was one of the things we identified was that oftentimes when people don't have a ride home that's gonna be able to show up in a timely fashion, uh, nurses and, and hospital staff don't realize we have alternatives. If we need to and someone's independent, we can send them home in a cab. Mm -hmm. So, we have other less expensive alternatives for those folks that would otherwise, you know, really truly, ideally these folks shouldn't require a staff member to be there. Because we're saying they're appropriate medically to be discharged from the hospital. So our goal is to kind of help them facilitate that exit as yeah. much as possible. Time for one more question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Just look the difference. Yeah. Write the second <laughs> question down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 So actually, this is a recurring theme uh, uh, from every site. When they identify the pharmacy and doctor's e-script automatically goes to that pharmacy, mm -hmm. so have you guys considered that in, in this workflow? We have not. We have not, but we're not at that but phase we're not, yet. We're, yeah, we yeah. just started creating that. It'll tell you like some of the yes. sniffs, what's happening, the doctors put the scripts in and they mm -hmm. are going to outside pharmacies. And so then they get the sniff and they're being threatened to send them back because they don't have scripts because yeah, they're at Walgreens. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is something, <coughs> that epic issue mm -hmm. needs to really be considered sure, for okay. all prescriptions. Okay. Outside specifically when it's a patient going to a, a skilled Which, nursing facility. Well, mm -hmm. in patients too, if they identify their pharmacy of choice and it's an epic that it's Walgreens, mm -hmm and doctors are e-scripting, they will automatically go there. Mm -hmm. We have to trigger the, we want them to go to our pharmacy. And, and, yeah, and that's, a, that's an issue. It's been a big issue for the providers. Did you get that change? You know, they're getting calls, and their scripts are somewhere where they don't go to be fed them to be. It's not that it needs to be manually changed. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then was there a second question we can write down for a parking lot? Sure. Um, the time period um, for an irresponsible patient who cannot go home by themselves, who does need their coming in at 5 o'clock, my friend gets off at 5 o'clock, I can't go home until 6, and now I'm just sitting here all day for one patient because I'm not eligible to go to the discharge unit because I wouldn't get that. Are there any interventions in that time period that you guys have come up with besides CAB, I mean, for irresponsible or people who are um, vulnerable who can't go home? We know here at St. Joe's we have a big population in that regard. I know St. Clair has uh, folks like that, and I'm just not as familiar with um, St. Francis to say they do or don't, but um, 
We will be addressing those more on an individual basis rather than a process basis. Uh, I know that we've got a care manager who specializes in more challenging discharges, so we might be calling on her for that. And I've just gotten the big high yeah. sign. I need to grab you guys. Hope you guys, you guys move spot. to the next area. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys. Oh, good good job. Job. Putting that on my list. So this is the response to the patient. What do we see, you ask, what do we see? Yes, we are thinking when looking at thee. We may seem to be hard when we hurry and fuss, but there's many of us and too few, there's many of you and too few of us. We would rather, we would like far more time to sit by you and talk, to bathe you and feed you and help you to walk, to hear of your lives and the things that you've done, your childhood, your husband, your daughter, and your son. But time is against us, there's much, there's too much to do. Patients too many and nurses and care health care givers too few. We grieve when we see you so sad and alone, with nobody near you, no friends of your own. We feel all of your pain and all of your fear, that nobody cares now your time is so near. But health care workers are people with feelings as well. And when we're together, you'll often hear us tell of an old, a dear oldest friend in the very end bed and that lovely old dad and the things that he said. We speak with compassion and love and feel sad when we think of your lives and the joy that you have. And when the time has arrived for you to depart, you leave us behind with an ache in our heart. When you sleep the long sleep, no more worry or care. There are other people we must, we must be there. There are other people, so we must be there. So please understand if we hurry and fuss. There are many of you and too few of us. And so our work in the CPE journey is to remove the redundancy that takes away our time, that prevents each of you in this room from taking care of the patients the way you want to do, and to improve, improve the quality. And we know that we want to look at it from a cost financial because that's some of the things that's doing. We want to do that, and we want to have exceptional patient satisfaction, and exceptional employee satisfaction, and exceptional care that we provide here. So great, and thank you each thank of you, you for coming. My name is Cyril. I'm the clinical manager of the med search unit here at St. Joseph Medical Center. My best advice is, I think for me, just um, realizing that um, I think all of us, including me, once when we roll out a process, we want it to um, be good the first time. We want to see results right away. And so going through the training and going through this process, um, my advice would be, you know, to to um, to expect that you're not going to see results right away, um, but no, you know, little um, little adjustments and little work that we do can um, make a big difference. But you know, just not not get discouraged if you don't see the results that you're hoping for right away. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Kelly. I manage therapy services at St. Joseph's Medical Center, and going through the. Uh, the CPE simulation in the initial training was um, very eye-opening for me in a few ways. One of the things is I had actually been through some lean training before, so I was familiar with a lot of the concepts. Um, however, I've been through that training with people that were already in management positions or um, in some sort of leadership role. Mm -hmm. And now I went through training with people who are line staff who have no idea about these concepts. And they're more focused on their day-to-day -day work. And it was very enlightening for me to be able to take what I knew, um, transfer that knowledge in a way that could really speak to not only managers but also line staff. and 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 improve my way of communicating those concepts so that I can go back and talk about it at my hospital. Um, so that was that was my takeaway, my big takeaway from, from the initial training. I think through the process so far, um, some of the things that I've really enjoyed are watching my colleagues on my team. So I'm part of the discharge team and um, some of my colleagues who are line staff folks from various parts of the hospital who are 
by their own recognition, very introverted and shy, and they have come alive. And initially in our first few meetings, they were so quiet, and I actually am someone who likes to get things done. And so I was a little worried at first. I thought, oh gosh, we don't have the right people on the team. What are we gonna do? And really, they just needed time. And now they not only participate fully, but they bring more to the table. And then they go back and talk to their colleagues. And then the next meeting, they bring even more to the table. So it's really been just a really exciting process for me to watch that enthusiasm grow. And all I'm doing is watching it. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think my advice to any team that's um, venturing out on a CPE project, I think the first thing I would say is be patient. <laughs> that was my, my big personal lesson. Um, it takes time. Um, it takes time for you to recognize and really delve into the situation and the problems that you're identifying. And so you're not going to have a quick fix. And really you don't want a quick fix. You want an effective fix. And that takes longer. And I think the other thing I would say is um, really make sure that you've got a very strong representation of your frontline staff from all areas. We've got folks from environmental services and folks that are transporters and folks from the lab and um, nursing staff. Um, we've got it all and it's it's really enabled our team as a whole to, to come up with some really solid um, problems and, and possible solutions. Mm -hmm. So that's it. My name is Ben Chrisley. I'm involved with the CPE process. Uh, I went to the initial two-day training. Uh, you know, initially I didn't really know what was going on. Um, we got there, um, the facilitators took us through a ton of exercises and, and led us down this road to give us a fuller picture of what the process is going to look like. Um, I can tell you now that we've implemented it six weeks later. Um, we've made great strides and we're pushing forward and the team's working well together and now we're getting to the point where we're going to implement. Um, it's pretty exciting. My advice to you is to absorb it, take it in, uh, and just go forward and be a change agent. And uh, good luck. My name is Angel. I'm a CNA on the third floor at St. Anthony's Hospital. Um, I Coming into this, I was very skeptical. I had a lot of questions. Um, as we all know, we've had a lot of committees that uh, just kind of fell through the cracks and uh, you kind of, when you first go into this, you kind of think, well, you know, is this really gonna work? The uh, information that we were taught uh, was very useful. Um, it was helpful to um, get that information before actually doing this. Um, now that we are going through the process, I am a little more confident. I do feel a little overwhelmed still at times, and I do think that there will be a lot of kickback, um, which I suspected to begin with anyways, but I am a little more confident. The biggest piece of advice I can give is to um, stay optimistic. Um, patience um, is, is huge. Be patient with each other. Be patient with the people who are giving you feedback. Understand that um, them giving you feedback is an opportunity for you to learn where they're coming from and um, to utilize that information um, when, when we're needed. I'm John Skelton. I'm an ER tech here at St. Anthony's. Um, going into the CPE, at first it was three days of training. Um, and I was with a large group, I don't really know many people. Um, there's some activity set up and normally I'm a pretty quiet person, I'm pretty reserved. I don't usually speak unless I really feel the need to. Um, kind of observe before I make any decisions or really get involved. I just want to get a feel for how other people are thinking and the way they respond to different things and kind of get a feel for it before I start interacting or really putting an input in. Um, was a little bit against, not against the process at first, but you know, I'm doing it on my days off, it's extra work. Um, I didn't really have an idea of what it was going to be about, um, but now that we brought it back to our 
actual hospital and begun the real process, I see that there's a great opportunity to make a change um, and to be a part of something and interacting with all the managers of the hospital and all the charge nurses and not only learn a lot about the rest of the hospital and how it works on the inside and the outside, but to be a voice and part of the change and um, really put my input in because I have a different perspective than you know a nurse does and they have a different perspective than the doctor does and then this kind of brings us all together so we can hear that other person's perspective rather than just assuming what it may be. Yeah. The biggest piece of advice would be to be patient and to give it a chance and give it time and even when you're implementing things there's going to be some pushback and you just have to be patient and understand that it comes and that it's a process <laughs> like anything is and just because you got a little pushback doesn't mean you can back down or fold you know if you're doing the right thing you're doing the right thing and that's really what it's about it's about doing the right thing for the patient and for your employees my name is Ann Jensen I am a charge nurse on a medical surgical unit at St. Anthony Hospital um, before being involved in CPE, I didn't have any idea of what the whole process was going to entail. Um, during our training, we, um, we were given different tools on how to identify root cause of problems and how to break it down. There was a lot of myth busting and data gathering and um, validating. That was a very important part of um, our training, was to realize that that was a big part of the process. Um, my biggest piece of advice for other people starting this process is to trust the process. Your, um, your coaches and teachers are very good at what they're trying to help you do and you will be surprised that what they're having you do will actually make sense and um, bring good things. Okay, well I'm Kirsten Hawkins. I work at St. Anthony. Do you already? <laughs> And, and I'm, um, I have a triple role here. I'm a charge nurse in critical care, I'm a staff nurse in critical care, and I'm a house supervisor on occasion. So I get to see a lot of different parts of uh, what we do here at St. Anthony's. So um, in being picked as part of the CPE team here, um, I have learned from my experience uh, working at Franciscan that they not only do things well, they do things exceptionally well. So being involved in the training for CPE, it was really exciting to kind of see how they brought together some amazing people to give us this training. Um, and part of um, what occurred during that time it was a lot of team building. Um, they gave us a lot of tools to essentially be able to work together well as a team, to respect each other. Um, there was a lot of different people from different positions involved that were, um, it was really a benefit of being exposed to each other's opinions and experience that was really beneficial. So if there's any advice I can give to you, it's, um, I would say a lot of it is just take it all in, um, open yourself up to different things that you may not be, have been exposed to before that are really proven to work well. Um, and um, also to, to take, to really take time to listen to what everybody in the team has to say because you're going to be surprised at how well it all comes together and how it all really um, melts into a really amazing process. So um, I'm really excited about what's going to happen here um, as we work together and I think that um, it will, it's not only going to be a benefit to all of the staff but definitely to the patient and to the organization um, as a whole. So thank you.